Disrupting how you do business. Disrupting how business works. Disrupting what it means to be human. How we behave. How we think. How we live. You are at the center of digital disruption. Ready for it? Ahead of it. Harnessing the power. Leading with resilience. Fearlessly. Technology is the how of change. You are the why of change. Exponentially evolving the digital experience. Mastering the technology. Laying the foundation for disruption. Transforming business and optimizing our lives. You are the future. You are the disruptor. You are resilient and ready. Welcome to Zerdocon 2018. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Zorocon 2018, our first annual Zorocon. We're happy to see a full house here. Um, really pleased to see how this place is growing every year, again and again. Um, just before we're starting with our keynote, my name is Gil. I'm the uh, Chief Marketing Officer of Zoto, if you don't know me. And just a few kind of like housekeeping notes, and then we'll uh, switch right to our keynotes. So first of all, uh, really packed today's agenda. A couple of pointers there. Today, 1 p.m. sharp here, our big uh, uh, keynote of the conference. Our CEO is going to really have some exciting announcements, so be here sharp 1 p.m. because we're going to start on time. Then uh, we have the, uh, of course, it's uh, lots of sessions before and after the keynote, and then we'll do a little bit of a whole crawl uh, with some food here in the conference, and then we'll be moving to our party in just next to Fenway there in Gillian's, there will be shuttle buses here downstairs, uh, uh, just like walk down the conference, and there will be shuttle buses there. So remember, uh, sessions, keynote, sessions, drinking, party, OK? Uh, very easy to remember. Uh, we actually have our, we're featuring our own band, and that's going to be amazing. And it's a very fun place there. Um, here, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors. OK, we have uh, lots of uh, sponsors, both our alliance partners and uh, cloud service providers. They're all there in the hall. Please take the time, go see what they have to offer, because there's some really, really cool things that they want to talk to you about and uh, offer for you. We have the labs. Anybody that didn't sign up for the labs and want to do some certifications or anything like that, the labs are all the way down the hall. And you can just like, uh, you know, take advantage of being here, try the product, try to, uh, or maybe even do a certification, OK? Just making sure I didn't forget anything, because then someone will I'll be in trouble. Ah, good. So a few notes, uh, uh, a few pointers about our keynote speaker. First of all, he's actually a local. He was uh, raised in Boston. Second, he's a frequent, uh, he's a frequent uh, appearances on uh, CBS. He's actually every week on CBS TV. OK. He wrote a book about the Cold War. OK, which is, I found very interesting. Uh, he actually led the digital transformation in The New Yorker. And right now, I'm really happy to welcome the editor of chief of uh, Wired Magazine, Nick Thompson. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Gil. Thank you. All your... this, is a very, this is a very kind introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be here because May is the most beautiful month in Boston. Secondly, because everybody I've talked to this morning, a whole bunch of them is a Wired subscriber, so you are my people. I'm very happy. And third, I used to be a musician, and so I believe the last time I was on a stage in Boston, it was about 15 years ago, and the woman who preceded me threw up on a pool table while I was playing. So if we can do better than that, we're off to a good start. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me here to Zerto, and I am going to talk about this, the future of being human. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the most interesting technological and scientific transformations that we're going through, things that will change the nature of how we're born, how we die, how we live, how we relate to each other, how we work. I'm going to do it chronologically, from birth through death. And my starting point is this. Technology does make things better. It improves things. It makes our lives richer. Sometimes that's hard to see. I think you probably all believe that you're in the field. But it's also the case, and this is the reason why I love my job at Wired Magazine, that there are choices we make about the way technology develops, about the scientific things we do and the scientific things we don't do, about the way algorithms work, that change the way we relate to each other and change the way our species works, and change the whole nature of what it means to be human. And there's a set of choices that we make as a society. Sometimes we don't even know what those choices are, but they're profoundly important and profoundly affect the lives of our children 
and even the lives that the rest of us will live. And so the reason I like to give talks like this, and the reason I like to edit Wired and why it's exciting to come to work every morning is the chance to engage in these conversations, to say, okay, these are the things that's happening. Let's figure out how to do it right. Let's figure out how to do it better. Let's figure out what's good. Let's figure out what's bad. And let's do that and not that. So that's my starting point. And it's particularly important because I genuinely believe that technology has been improving. It has been improving. It is improving steadily. It has been improving in amazing ways. And it is about to go much faster. And the reason for that, there are a bunch of reasons for that that I'll get into, but one of which is that we're about to reach the moment where computers are unambiguously smarter than us in all domains. And not only that, but where the computers will be able to build the next set of computers. And I believe there'll be an acceleration to technology. Same, similar things are happening in science, particularly since so much of science is based on silicon chips, is based on technology, is based on computers. So as computers improve, the science improves. You're all familiar with this, Moore's Law. Right? Technology, more or less, the speed of transistors, more or less doubles every year and a half. That doesn't sound like a ton, doubling every year and a half, until you expand it out a bit, right? It means that in, you know, Eight years, it's 100 times better. So the phone you have, it cost $800. In a few years, will cost $8, right? And in 15 years, technology is 1,000 times better. And that's wild, right? It means the little phone you have in your pocket is more computing power than the supercomputers that Ronald Reagan had at his disposal at the height of the Cold War. And not only that, but the technology will just keep improving. It will not stop. And it will not stop because the machines we build help us build the next machines. And so Moore's Law will just continue. And I think. With some of the technologies I'm going to talk about later, it will accelerate, perhaps. Right? This is the point Mark Andreessen making that point. Innovation accelerates and compounds. Each point in front of you is bigger than anything that's ever happened. This does not stop. There is no moment where you catch up to technology, where suddenly it's advanced enough and you've got it. It doesn't. It just goes faster and faster and faster. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to live in that world, the world where technology just gets faster, where each invention helps us get to the next invention, which then helps us get to the next invention and the one beyond that. And the trouble with this, or the complexity with this, back to what I said at the beginning, science, ga science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. The technology improves faster than we're able to understand it, faster than we're able to figure out what it's doing to us or figure out what it's doing. George Kennan, who I wrote that book about, said that it's a very dangerous thing when the world of the father is no longer relevant to the world of the son, where technology has changed so much that our children can't understand what we understand. And so that's, again, why I like these conferences, why I like these talks, why I like these conversations, because it's a chance and a moment to reflect on this and to think about those big changes. And then I want to, before I get right into the chronology, this is, I think is a very important thing to remember too. I'm going to talk a lot about a lot of complicated things that can seem maybe bad, maybe dark. But basically, you can follow this grid with all technology. So let's use AI. Will AI make us all geniuses? No. Will AI make us all morons? No. Will AI destroy whole industries? Yes. You could also put in cryptocurrencies. You could put in anything you want here. Will AI make us more empathetic? No. Will AI make us less caring? No. Will teens use AI for sex? Yes. Were they going to have sex anyway? Yes. Will AI destroy music? No. Will AI destroy art? No. But can we go back? No. Will AI bring about world peace? No. This is a good chart to just remember. This is the stages and the conversations we always have about every kind of new technology. And mostly, it's good. OK, great. Childhood. So. Um, the nature of childhood is changing in some very interesting ways. And the first of which is who gets to have children. So we're on the edge, or not on the edge, we're maybe five or ten years away, not from IVF, but from IVG, from the capacity to take a human cell, you know, taking it from the inside of your cheek, and transform it into sperm, transform it into egg, and then implant into a womb and have a child. So what does that mean? Well, it means that an individual could be both the mother and the father of a child means that a gay couple could have, same-sex couple, same couple could have one provide the sperm, one provide the egg, whether they're both female or both men. It means that you could completely change the nature of who can have children and who can have families, which is great, right? And this is why, it means somebody who's infertile can have a child. Or it means somebody who wanted to have a child with their spouse and their spouse died suddenly can take hair follicles from the hairbrush and turn that into the sperm or the egg. And that's good. It's very good. And you can see cases where it's unambiguous that the goal of the scientist should be to make this technology work. And you can also see cases where it starts to get a little more complicated, where it starts to change the nature of how we relate to each other. Combine this with CRISPR. Right? So CRISPR, we're in Boston, one of the homes of CRISPR. CRISPR is a technology that allows us to edit genes, allows us to take certain DNA sequences out, change them, replace them. 
And at first it will be used to prevent diseases, right? Or to change genes that put you at a risk of heart attack. You know, we don't exactly know how genes map to future outcomes and what puts us at risk and what makes us stronger or what makes us weak. So like, the genome is incredibly complex, right? We've been able to print it out. We've reached the point where we could print it, and now we're getting to the point where we can edit it. We don't know all the consequences. But at first, we will use this for things like curing diseases and preventing diseases, and then we will use it to make babies who look like this. You know, and we'll implant, we'll see what Michael Phelps has, and we'll put it in all of our children. And that will be good, right? We all would like to have a little bit of Michael Phelps in us. But also it'll be complicated, right? Because it will come to the rich first, and it will happen in developed countries first. It will happen to certain individuals. In fact, it may, not ha may happen to rich people in island nations where they have weaker rules. So we're entering a period of real complexity about this as we get close to CRISPR and as we get close to childbirth. And then there's this. And that is that our children are learning how technology works. That's a very important stage. I have kids who are nine, seven, and four. And one of the most complicated and interesting things for me is how do I introduce them to tech? How do I make them love tech? How do I make them maybe want to be computer scientists? How do I make them maybe want to work in security? How do I make them want to understand artificial, artificial intelligence without having them get lost in it, right? Without having them sucked into video games, without having them sucked into things that can have negative effects. Without, you know, Facebook has just launched Facebook Messenger for kids, for kids age six. I don't really want my kids in that, right? Every technology company is going to try to market to them. I do want them to understand STEM. I do want them to understand science. I do want them to understand technology, but you need to be careful with it. It's one of the most interesting things for a parent. Because you see, every one of you who has a kid has probably seen at age two how they react to an iPad or how they react to an iPhone and the lights coming out on the screen and it's hypnotizing in a way that's scary. But also, the future we're about to head into, a world they need to be able to grapple with. So that's another interesting thing about childhood. It's an adolescence. It's one of my favorite cartoons, too. Um, I'm going to tell a story about, about teenagers. So when I started this job at Wired, um, I got an email from this guy, from Kevin's sister. I started, I started the same week as Trump, so I've been here about a year and a half. Uh, and a couple months in, I got an email from sister asking me to coffee. And I have a very general, very specific rule, which is that if a billionaire invites you to coffee, you say yes. Um, and so I went to go see Kevin. I went down to Menlo Park to go see Systrom. And you know, what are you working on? What are you doing? And he's, you know, talked about some of the products they've launched, some of the interesting things they've had, the building expansion, all that. And then he said, you know what we're really trying to do? I said, what? He said, we're trying to make the internet nicer. Well, why are you trying to make the internet nicer? Well, because kids use Instagram. We're trying to make it a place where kids don't get bullied. Said, well, that's an interesting idea. We're trying to make it a place that's safe for younger people. And how do you do that? And it turns out the way you do that it's really complicated and has some interesting trade-offs that I want to talk about. So what he did is he started building a set of algorithms and a set of product changes to make Instagram nicer, to change the whole tone of it. First one, um, he beta tested on Taylor Swift's Instagram page, which I think is hilarious for all of you in the room who know when you launch a product, you probably don't want to launch it on the highest stakes uh, account on your service, but they did. And this thing they launched was the ability to remove certain words or emojis. Ms. Swift had gotten in a fight with Ms. Kardashian. I can't remember what it was about, but it was severe. Ms. Kardashian's fans had put a whole bunch of green snakes on Taylor Swift's Instagram page, which is not nice. And so Instagram came up with a product that would allow you to automatically remove any emoji or any word, try to make the conversations more civil. So the first thing we saw was the green snakes disappeared from Taylor Swift's feed. Nobody knew why, because they didn't tell anybody. They didn't tell anybody they'd done this. All the green snakes were gone. Then they told people, and they rolled it out. And so now on Instagram, you can remove certain words. So that's nice. It's pretty simple. That's a pretty basic product change. Next thing they did is they started rolling out um, anti-suicide tools. Incredibly interesting stuff. So in the beginning, it's just if somebody starts to put hashtag suicide or hashtag cutting, it would put up a little warning. Uh, you know, here's a guidance counselor you can call. Here's a number. Here's how you can get help. Facebook is now taking this to another degree, which is kind of amazing, which is if its machine learning systems pick up that somebody's about to harm themselves, they will actually call the local sheriff. And so there's starting to be examples of sheriffs who've been called saying, hey, there's somebody at, you know, 225 Broadway, you know, you should go to their house. And people's lives have been saved that way. Now, that's the second thing Instagram ruled out was suicide prevention. Third thing they ruled out, the rolled out, was spam prevention. And then they got to the really interesting stuff, the really complicated stuff. And that is trying to build a machine, lear machine learning system to identify cruelty, to identify bullying, to identify meanness. Because again, it's kids who use Instagram, teenagers, and we don't want them bullied. We don't want people saying mean things. We don't want them saying you're fat on somebody's page. 
So how do you identify that? And so Instagram worked on this really interesting project. They hired a ton of people. They had them sort through thousands, tens of thousands of comments, label them mean, bullying, racist, sexist, et cetera. And then they built an AI system to look at a clean data set, sorry, to look at those rankings again, to run their rules through it and see whether they match the humans. And they iterate, 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 and then they test them both on a clean data set. But it's a hard problem. So here's a, here's a post. I don't know whether you can read it all, but it shows the complexity of this problem. So this is one of Kevin Systrom's posts. And these are what, this is what people have written on it. I'll show you the complexity of identifying whether something is mean or cruel. Go to the window and take a big leap out of it. That is very mean, right? Not a nice thing to say. But all the individual words in it are nice. Window is a nice word. It's a lovely word. Leap, like leap of faith, that is a nice word too. So that's a hard sentence to figure out the meaning. Meme lives matter. What does that mean? Right? It depends on context and time. This is from June of 2016 where Instagram is being criticized for being too kind to Black Lives Matter and too cruel to the right. So it's actually, this is like a political criticism. You suck. That is, that is mean. That's easy even. <laughs> Pretty, I could write a machine learning system that would get rid of you suck. Watermelon, watermelon. I don't know. I saw that. I thought that was nice, right? It's a picnic or something. Turns out it's sexual innuendo in the context that it's in. You can delete memes, but not cancer patients. I love meme lives matter. The point is, it's really hard to identify what's cruel and what's not cruel. And so Instagram spent a ton of time on this. This was the biggest project for Instagram over the last year and a half, and they didn't really tell anybody about it. And then they rolled it out. They gave me an exclusive look to go meet with all the engineers. That's kind of amazing. You go to Instagram now, and you type something mean, and it just disappears. You see it. It appears on you. You, you, you don't know that it's been removed. But if you write something mean on my feed, I can't see it, and no one else who comes to my feed can see it. Only you can see it. Or I write something mean, it's in reverse. And that's kind of incredible. It's really interesting, and it makes Instagram nicer, right? <laughs> That's good. It's better for kids. That's the goal. One of the reasons why Instagram use is picked up for kids, I would imagine, because there isn't as much bullying, there isn't as much hate, there isn't as much cruelty. It makes the parents more likely to let their kids use Instagram. But it's also kind of crazy, right? Because we live in a country where one of the principles is free speech, the right to say what you want to say. The way conversations in this country work, they happen on social media platforms, a lot of them. And now one of them is just vaporizing content. And it's vaporizing content because of machine learning systems that have identified something as cruel. That is a hard, weird thing. So I asked Kevin about that. Well, there's a age-old debate between free speech mm -hmm. and oh, like, what is the limit of free speech? And is it free speech to just be mean to someone? And I think if you look at the history of the law around free speech, et cetera, you'll find that generally there's a line where like, you don't want to cross because you're starting to be aggressive or be mean or, or racist. And you get to a point where you want to make sure that in a closed community that's trying to grow and thrive, you make sure that you actually optimize for overall free speech. So if I don't feel like I can be myself, if I don't feel like I can express myself, because if I do that, I will get attacked. That's not a community we want to create. So we just decided to be on the side of making sure that we optimized for speech that was expressive and felt like you had the freedom to be yourself. So that's defensible, right? That's interesting. I kind of like that philosophy for my kids, but it's not James Madison. And it's one of those, what, what I mean when I say that we're making decisions right now that have a huge effect on the way our society develops. The fact that we set free speech as principle for America had a huge effect on the way America developed. And to some extent, I mean, obviously, he doesn't have the power of the writers of the Constitution, but in some extent, he is writing a Constitution for the 500 million people who use Instagram, and he's making a choice right there. He's making a choice about how to value speech, how to value free speech versus bullying and the other things he's getting rid of. So that's the kind of choice we're making as a society, or that we make in the technology community, in the technology world, that's profound. And this one will have a huge effect on teens. All right, let's move a little later in life. College and the years of rebellion. So I remember very distinctly. So my job has more or less been long-form journalism, right, since, since I gave up on that music thing. Um, working at magazines that publish long magazine stories, 5,000 words, 6,000 words, 10,000 words, 20,000 words. And I remember getting so scared in about 2005. There's all this research. You know, kids don't pay attention. No one can pay attention to anything anymore. No one reads anything to completion. You know, it's just going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And I was like, I should probably quit this field, right? Because if college kids aren't reading, then uh, what's, the, what's the point? If everything's just going to get shorter, we have no attention spans. It's my favorite cartoon, by the way, I think, in the history of cartoons. And I remember that. And I remember thinking I should leave. And I remember reading an interview. It was in The Atlantic, I believe. 
and this is a Rhodes Scholar, a couple years younger than me. I don't read books. I go to Google and I can absorb wealth and information quickly. I remember just that quote just stung me. Right? If America's Rhodes Scholars are not reading books, what is the point of my job? <laughs> You're just going to write to an older and older demographic, and eventually they're going to go away, and no one is going to read what you do, and there's no point. But I stuck it out, and I stayed with it. I was at the Legal Affairs at the time, a law magazine in New Haven, and I moved to the New Yorker, moved to Wired, and then to the New Yorker. And it turned out that it seemed like people were reading. In fact, in the New Yorker, I got to see all their omniture, partially chart beat dashboards. <laughs> people were really the reading the longer stories. In fact, they were reading them beginning to end. If they got through the first 15% of the story, there's like a 95% chance they'd get to the end. So they, they read everything. I was like, huh. I remember going back and thinking, I wonder what happened to that guy whose quote really stuck with me. What happened to Joe O'Shea? So I Googled him, looked him up. He's an author. <laughs> he writes books. And I talked to him. He's like, oh, yeah, I just was just reading Remembrance of Things Past. I thought, huh. And then I started thinking about it more. And it turns out that basically every element of the culture, you know, we are, our attention spans are shortening in certain ways, but the complexity of books, of culture, is just getting deeper and deeper. Right? Think about TV. Think about MASH. Good show, right? Well, think about the complexity of MASH versus the complexity of Game of Thrones. World of difference. The characters, the storylines, the plots. Because we have the internet, we can have communications, and we go to Wikipedia and see what season three, episode seven was, because we can follow this, because we can look things up, because we can have Reddit conversations, because there can be constant follow-ups on every website, our complexity to absorb and follow really intense storylines has just gone up. Same thing is happening you know, in the magazine world, where the best stuff is, in fact, longer, deeper, more complicated. Think about serial, right? Think about that versus radio that we used to listen to 10 years ago. So this is one thing, one thing where I am absolutely optimistic and I'm extremely pleased. I was terrified that we were ineluctably, our attention spans were getting shorter and shorter, but it just does not seem that the way at all. The evidence is to the contrary. Yes, we use Snapchat. Yes, we use Twitter. Yes, we do short things. Yes, my text messages, I put you instead of Y-O-U. But we are getting to read more complicated stuff, and I think that is a great thing. So that's an important part of kids in their early 20s, a very important thing to remember. And I want to talk about something else that happens at that age, which is political protest, which I think has been profoundly shaped by technology. And in fact, some of the technologies that we use today were created and shaped kind of for the purpose of protest, or for the purpose of bringing down dictatorships. Remember, that was the notion of Twitter during the Green Revolution. Right? The United, remember the United States government policy planning staff asked, Twitter not to do a service outage repair during the time of the Green Revolution. It's what helped get people together in Tahrir Square. It's a profoundly important thing. But this is Tahrir Square, and this is Wael Gonim, the Google engineer who helped organize that. And one of the things we learned about political protest, which I think is really important, that we started to learn in about 2009, 2010, is that it is a great tool for young people at that stage in life, or for anybody, to get together very quickly and form weak bonds very suddenly. And it's very good for fueling outrage. It's very good for bringing down governments. It's very good for quick mass action. You can see it with the Parkland students, too. You can see the ability to very quickly get the attention of a country, very quickly make a lot of change. But what we haven't seen is the capacity for technology to create weak, stronger bonds for the people who bring about the change to then govern, or to bring the full transformation that they want. It's led to a lot of episodic protest, but we haven't seen the long-term gains. And part of that, you know, we see this very clearly in the Arab Spring, which maybe happened too quickly. Maybe the government, I mean, obviously, the reason the Arab Spring has not brought democracy and peace is not just because of Twitter, right? I mean, there are like a hundred factors that are bigger. But perhaps one, one factor is that technology made everything happen too fast. Maybe it does make political protests go too fast. Maybe it does spark outrage cycles that are too quick. It also, in American politics, it leads to people who are able to take advantage of the episodic short surge of adrenaline that social media brings having success. You know, Donald Trump, I think I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Twitter. He is one of the greatest users of Twitter there is. That's not to say good or bad, it's just that I think in the future, candidates like Trump who are able to capitalize on our outrage will have more success than people who move a little bit slower, who think a little more cautiously. If you think about some of his, like a John Kasich candidate, who have a much harder time uh, surviving and thriving in a period of social media affecting politics. So that's interesting. It could lead to good. It could lead to bad. I spent a ton of time on this in the context of Facebook. You know, I spent, I wrote 11,000 words with my writing partner, Fred Vogelstein, about what happened at Facebook in the last two years. And the short story is, in the spring of 2016, 
they were accused of having political bias. They're accused of being biased against Republicans. And they know they can't do that, right? They're supposed to be connecting the world. They're all Democrats, right? They're Silicon Valley Democrats. Sheryl Sandberg is going to go work in the Hillary Clinton administration. Besides Peter Thiel, basically everybody with any power at Facebook is a Democrat. And they were very worried, though, about political bias because they didn't want to be regulated. They know where power is. And so what they did is when they were accused of political bias, they basically stepped back and they stopped and they stopped doing anything. And the problem was at about that same time, this is May of 2016, where they're accused of having bias, where they you know, bring 17 Republicans out to, fa to Facebook to you know, have a meeting and break bread. Right about then is when we start to see a crisis with fake news, where we start to see stories where Macedonian teenagers or people even from Marin County realize that you can put stories online saying that the Pope has endorsed Donald Trump and it will get lots of traffic and drive attention and dollars. They don't even care who wins. They're just trying to monetize our outrage. Same time where the Russians started to really you know, use the platform. And Facebook put its head in the sand. And so that was one problem during the election. Facebook trying so hard to appear neutral that it actually didn't pay attention to the problems on the platform. The other problem, and it's a more core problem, is that Facebook's algorithm, again, like Twitter, is designed to get our attention, to spur outrage. If I put something on Facebook that says Donald Trump sucks, it will get lots of shares, likes, and, and it will spread. If I say here's a complicated argument about why his net neutrality position is wrong, it won't go anywhere. Facebook's algorithm, because it's been tuned to our sort of emotional instincts, encourages that kind of, out, kind of outrage. And that, I think, is something that really helped Trump win. It also helped Obama win. It's not, it's not partisan. It's that candidates who develop strong emotional responses with their supporters have a much better time on social media platforms. And during the 2016 election, it was used by Trump better than anybody else before. And so Facebook since then has been grappling with that and dealing with that. I actually was out in Menlo Park yesterday meeting with eight of the executives who work on Newsfeed, the sort of the core algorithm that determines what we read inside of Facebook. And they are working hard. They understand that they can't be a place where misinformation spreads or misinformation is created. And they're trying hard to stop that. But it's baked deep in. And it's hard to unbake. And that is one of the great technological challenges is can Facebook fix itself? That's one of the things I'm most interested in the world of tech. And will have a proud, profound effect on politics in this country. I mean, there is no question in my mind that social media is one of the main reasons why Donald Trump was elected. You know, again, I don't want to be partisan either, whether you like him or not, but it has a profound change in this country. And so these algorithms are at the core of one of the most important changes that happened in America, which was the election of Trump. All right, so now let's move to adulthood. That was, I mean, obviously it affects adults who is president and how we all use it. But let's talk about how all of us in the room use technology. Um, so one thing, we sometimes think of kids as the ones who need to be taught about how technology should be used. We sometimes think about teaching children how to use it appropriately. But in fact, we're the ones who need to use it appropriately, right? We have these phones in our pockets. You know, again, more power than Ronald Reagan had at his disposal. And do these things make our lives better? Sometimes. But sometimes not. It's one of the most interesting things in text. We built these incredibly magical devices, and they're great. But we use them in ways that sometimes don't make us feel like our lives are richer. This is one of my favorite charts. Exists. And it gives you the data on how much time we spend in different apps and whether afterwards we feel like we were rewarded by that, whether it was time well spent. So there's certain things that we love. Google Calendar, spent a couple minutes every day and we are very happy we did. Waze, that's green, that's on the left. Super happy. We spend, how much do we spend in Waze? We spend 19 minutes a day in Waze. We spend 10 minutes a day in Evernote. We are extremely happy. I, I honestly, I probably spend like 25 minutes a day in Evernote, and I love all those 25 minutes. At the end of the day, I always wish I spent more time in Evernote. But now let's look at the right. Where are we actually spending our time? Well, we're spending 61 minutes a day in Grindr. Probably when we're traveling to conferences, it's more. Makes us unhappy. We spend 59 minutes a day in Facebook. 97 minutes a day, the people who are using WeChat. And these things make us miserable. Instagram, 54 minutes. Snapchat, 61 minutes. So what's so interesting about this chart is that the things we use a lot, we say we don't make our lives richer and we want that time back. And time is the one finite thing there is. You know? So every minute we spend in an app that's not making our life more fulfilling, it's a minute we don't spend doing something else. And this is really interesting. It's one of the most important things for adults. It's figuring out how to use our devices in a way that makes lives richer. And the tech companies are working on this. I'm sure Apple will roll out an interface that helps us manage this problem. Google just did. You, know, you can put in how much time you want to spend in an app, and then it'll tell you to get out if you've spent more than 44 minutes in Candy Crush Saga. Candy Crush saga. Um, so it's a real challenge. And that's one of the things in adulthood. We think about it for kids, but it's not just for kids. We have to learn how to live with our devices. 
We also are going to have to learn about truth. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. <laughs> Stay woke, bitches. I laugh every time I see that. And it's amazing. And it was using artificial intelligence and the incredible improvements we have in voice technology and the incredible improvements we have in image recognition technology to create something totally fake. Obama didn't say any of those words. That's a complete script. And what's so interesting is that we realized in the last election cycle, we were tricked by Macedonian teens, <laughs> right? What's going to happen two election cycles down the road? And one of the questions I asked at Facebook is, OK, you guys are working hard fighting disinformation in text. Next, you have to fight disinformation in images. You're going to have to fight disinformation in videos. Then you're going to have to fight disinformation in virtual reality. And maybe you're going to have to fight disinformation in like neural link interfaces. That's a really interesting problem. But it's something for all of us. How are we going to tell what's true from what's fake? And it's an arms race. And it's adversarial. Because the people who want to manipulate us will be very good at creating things that are fake. And I think this Obama video, despite being hilarious, it is true. <laughs> You know, this is, you know, figuring out what is real and what is fake is one of the things that will prevent us from becoming a fucked up dystopia. So I want to talk about AI for a minute. Because AI is the technology behind what we just saw, and AI is the technology in front of all kinds of amazing things. This is one of my favorite quotes about AI. AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It's more profound than, I don't know, electricity or fire. That's Sundar Pichai. Now, what's interesting about this quote is I could say the same thing, and it would be like a prediction. Sundar can say it. And because he thinks it, it will be real. Because he has the world's most powerful corporation at his disposal. And so if he genuinely believes that AI is more important or as important as electricity or fire, he will make AI as important as electricity or fire. Because he has all the resources in the world, the talented engineers, the data sets. AI is built on data. Google has nothing but tons of data. So this is a really important moment where Google is transitioning, making all of its products based on AI. Because it means the world will come along with it. The one thing I. Whenever I see this quote, it makes me stop. If it's one of the most important things humanity is working on and is more profound than electricity or fire, what the hell are the other things that are more important than the thing that is more important than electricity or fire? Anyway, let's see what Google has done with this stuff. Here's something they rolled out uh, two weeks ago. Hey, how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. For people, when? Um, Day, night? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like after like five people. For few, four people, you can come. So the voice on the left, the one you can totally understand, was AI generated. It's a machine. And the voice on the right is a real one. And it shows how far we've come, right? Because I remember a few years ago, you couldn't even talk to Dragon Speak and have it understand. And then we reached the point where you could talk to Alexa or Siri and it would understand what you were saying, or Cortana. Cortana. Now we've reached the point where Google, now this is within a relatively small domain and it's reasonably scripted, but that was a real call to a real restaurant. Reporters are still trying to figure out exactly what restaurant in Palo Alto they called, but no one has found it quite yet. Um, but that is amazing. Like, that we can go from where we were in voice capabilities and understanding context and semantic analysis and get to that point, that is crazy. And it's a little bit creepy, right? And all sort of all AI technology kind of goes against the edge. And Google, you know, for some insane reason, didn't have their robot announce that it was a robot, which led to a lot of criticism. But it is incredible technology. And so one of the things I think about is what are some of the questions with this technology? And sometimes I worry. I worry that the United States isn't doing enough. 
You know, there are companies that are doing enough. There are companies that are thinking through all the complexities of artificial intelligence. But is our government? And that was something that was worrying me. But I recently just had a 45 minute, maybe an hour long conversation with the president about questions like that, about whether an AI system has real military value, whether you can use an AI system to actually kill somebody, whether you can trust a computer to make that decision, whether AI will concentrate power too much in certain companies, what the role of the government is in opening up data sets, whether there are certain cultural values that need to be embedded in the data sets, whether there should be rules about transparency. It was a really interesting conversation. I was impressed every step of the conversation with the president and the way he thought through all these things. It was illuminating. But it wasn't the president of the United States. It was the president of France. It was Macron. You know, France has a national AI policy. Britain is now developing a national AI policy. China has said that one of their most important things is to have AI dominance, whatever the heck that means. I don't know whether it's in research products, military tech, or whatever. Have AI dominance by 2030. It's one of the most important things to the government. The United States kind of let it slide. We had a meeting at the White House last week. Good, good first step, but we've backslid a lot. And it's one of the things I worry about. You know, we have this technology that's coming, profoundly important. As you can tell, just from that Sundar call, this technology is going to change all kinds of things. We, you know, maybe it won't change as much as the optimists say. Maybe it won't be more important than fire, but it's going to be really important. And our government needs to be thinking about it. So that's something I worry about. All right, so now let's go to the next stage in life, which is work, not just adulthood and the sort of the existential problems we have, but will we actually have jobs in the future? I can't answer that, of course. Who knows? But uh, I can give you some scenarios. This is how I like to think about the AI and robotic transformation. There's sort of three ways the people I know well think about it. First is the way my colleagues at The New Yorker, my friends in New York, think about it. And that is that humans and machines have had a complicated relationship. And ever since the you know, 1900s, people have said the machines are going to take away our work. You know, My god, the car is going to get rid of the jobs for the horse and buggies. But mostly it's worked out. But now we're reaching a point where computers really will take all the jobs because computers will be able to do all the things that humans have been able to do. They will have dexterity. Robots will have dexterity, this thing that is flummoxed robot engineers. Machines will be able to have creativity. They'll be able to have instinct. There'll be nothing for us to do. In my field, journalism, right? Machines can already do sports reports. Facebook is working on an AI system for fact-checking. You can imagine an AI system for copying it. It won't be too long until they can replace me entirely. So that's scenario one. As computers get smarter, as robots get smarter, they'll basically move up the cognitive chain until we're completely replaced. That's scenario number one. The most dangerous would be, I don't know, think about self-driving cars. Self-driving cars will replace you know, trucking and driving. Transportation is the number one employer of males in the United States. What happens when all those guys lose their jobs? That's not going to be good, is it? So that's scenario one. Scenario two. This is more the way San Francisco sees things, the way my, you know, many of my colleagues see it, which is, well, that all may be true. Computers may be getting smarter than us. They will certainly take a lot of jobs, but we're probably going to be OK, because we've always been OK. In fact, if you look at some of the industries that have been most affected, it turns out they're doing fine. right? There was a lot of panic that tellers were going to lose their jobs when the ATMs came along. Well, it turns out the number of tellers has increased since the invention of the ATM, and in fact, they have more interesting jobs. With self-driving cars, sure. You know, a lot of long-haul truckers will use their job, but there'll be people who will put on VR rigs to navigate the trucks through cities. And in fact, the jobs that are being lost will be replaced by better jobs. And if you increase the efficiency of trucks and reduce the number of crashes, you'll be able to move so much more stuff around that you'll create all kinds of different jobs. In fact, if you look through human history, we've mostly been OK. So scenario two is, we've mostly been OK, but it's a little bit complicated and we're a little bit worried. And then section three, scenario three, that's Silicon Valley. And that is, every time there's been a panic, it's been OK. And in fact, we are worrying about jobs and we have 4.9% unemployment. And in fact, if you look at the data, there is very little job churn in this country. If you thought if robots and AI were really disrupting industries, you'd think there would be a lot of job churn. So the way Silicon Valley sees it is that we're basically going to be fine. In fact, it's all going to be OK. We don't know what we're going to do. My instinct, I'm somewhere between scenario two and scenario three, maybe a little more towards scenario three. I do think things are going to be good. But I do think this is obviously one of the most important debates we are having. Another thing that I'm really interested for work is the introduction of the blockchain. I say this not just because keynote bingo, you, everybody has the word blockchain on their bingo card, but also because a lot of what's, I think probably in this room you all know how the blockchain works. We don't know whether it will ultimately change a whole lot, right? There are all sorts of inefficiencies. Once you have a system in which all the computers are linked together and transactions have to go through it, it becomes quite slow. Right? Bitcoin is a wonderful system 
for investment. It's not such a great system for payments because the number of um, transactions that can be processed. But the thing about blockchain is they're all so much centralization, right? One of the great trends in technology is more power coming to a very small number of companies. And the one thing I see out there that could change that is blockchain. The capacity to recreate Twitter, not through a centralized database where it stores all our tweets and has all our information, but through a distributed database where everybody's linked to everybody through the blockchain is a profoundly interesting idea. And I do think there will be, well, not, I can't say that. I think there's a pretty good chance that there will be major disruption due to blockchain and it will cancel out this flow of centralization. So that's another thing we need to really think about as we think about the future of our workforce. Another thing is quantum computing. I didn't really think this was going to happen. I didn't really think quantum computing was real until recently. So the idea of quantum computing, here there's quantum physics that underlies the world where particles can be in both one place and another place and you observe them and they're no longer in the same place. And it's really confusing and nobody quite understands it. But above it, it kind of averages out into a world of Newtonian physics that we understand where I take a step and I'm you know, very grateful this is here and gravity is with me. The no idea of quantum computing is to take the notions of quantum physics and to apply them to the manufacturing of computers. And so instead of representing information in zeros and ones, you can actually represent information as anywhere in a state between zero and one. And it can create machines that are thousands, millions of times more powerful than the machines we have right now. You know, for those of you in the room, it has, you know, one of the things people talk about is the capacity to crack encryption. You're based on multiplying large prime numbers by each mother to be able to factor them. You can actually do that with a quantum computer. The number of calculations that you can do with a quantum computer will be you know, fairly small. It will only be for calculations that require mass computation and not a lot of input as you do the computation. But we're getting kind of close. There's an amazing thing that happened last week where um, Google uh, has declared that they've, you know, they're very close to quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy. It was the worst branding ever, right? Quantum supremacy, which sounds kind of like born supremacy. Um, quantum supremacy is the time where a quantum computer can do something that a classical computer can't do. And Google's like, we did it, or we're close to it. And then Alibaba was like, no, we just simulated all your results on a classical computer. It was the, one of like, the best screw you fights in the tech world. The American companies don't do that to each other. Anyway, kudos to Alibaba for that. The problem, of course, with quantum computing is that they're, you, know, you have to get the temperature down to near absolute zero. You need to, have a machine, you need to somehow be able to insert the data into the, you know, uh, <laughs> into the chips that you insert into the machine with that absolute zero temperature. You need to have a machine next to it where it's like four degrees Kelvin. It is incredibly complicated. If there's any earth tremor, if there's any light, it screws up the whole calculation. So we do not know if this is going to happen. We do not know whether it will be useful for lots of things. But having now seen some of the systems, <laughs> Having now seen some of the labs where Microsoft is building topological quantum computers, which may be more sturdy than the ones Google is building, having seen some of what they're building, I actually think this might come in limited ways. And if it does, it will have a profound effect on many of our businesses. And it will also have a profound effect on us. Because again, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. So if you can imagine machines inventing machines and you add the power of quantum computing with the data sets we have in AI, and then you set a machine to create the next machine and then that machine to create the next machine, that's why when we go back to that slide at the very beginning, which has time and humanity, that's why I think we're at that inflection point. As we reach the moment of incredible, incredible innovation, the machines building the machines afterwards. And quantum, maybe, possibly, perhaps, could do some of that. And so, what do you do in a world like that? What does your company do? What do you do when you have AI coming at you, when you have the blockchain coming at you, and quantum computing coming at you, and have all these profound changes? You've got to learn to adapt. You know, in journalism, we talk about Every time there's a new platform that comes up, the trick is to understand the rules of the platform and to be wired on that platform, right? To understand how YouTube works and to be wired on that platform. To understand how LinkedIn works and be like LinkedIn. To somehow get the essence of the new thing that is built and transform yourself to that. And so as things move faster and faster, that becomes harder and harder, but it's something we have to do. So adaption and resilience are the key. All right, stage six in life, retirement. After all this moment of work, a couple of things about retirement that are really interesting to me. One, in some ways we won't really retire. Because one of the things that technology has done is it created opportunities for sort of short-term jobs, right? The Uber driver, you know, leasing out your Airbnb, people who can work for Postmates. And we've always thought of those as jobs that young people do. But when you actually look at the data, there's another group of people that does a lot of those jobs. And it's old people. Because what those jobs need are flexibility with time, meaning you have some kind of income stream. Flexibility and mobility, you move to different places. These are, this is a couple that we wrote about in Wired. And they drive their RV around the country. And then every October through December, they work for Amazon. And they go to whatever warehouse they need. And it turns out there are thousands of people like this, people who either just need a little extra money, lost their retirement savings, can't quite live on Social Security. 
So I think the nature of retirement is changing because of these sort of these jobs, the not permanent jobs. Because when you're 30, 40, 50, you need to live in one place because you have kids and they go to school and it's hard to move. When you're 60, 70, or when you're in your 20s, you kind of move around. And so in some ways, what I think is going to happen is that people in their 60s and 70s are going to behave a little bit more like kids in their early 20s. And they're going to have some of those jobs. And you're going to have situations like these Amazon warehouses where you have kids who are just learning their first jobs, and then you have adults like these two. So that's an important change. Another important change about retirement is that medicine is getting way better because a lot of these technologies are coming to medicine first. If you work on AI, all the companies that have the best AI systems are working hard in medicine because they know that advances in medicine, if you can train your AI system to lead to a medical advance, society will completely accept it. If you lead it to like an advance in how to make restaurant reservations, people might get creeped out. But medicine is kind of given a free pass because it is good. And so this is a story we wrote about, the, you know, again, as I said earlier, image recognition is one of the areas where we've had the most improvement. Well, that's great for stroke victims. If you can identify somebody as having a stroke a few seconds before you previously could by looking at the CAT scan of anybody who's in an ambulance or in an ER, You've done something amazing. So retirement, medical care is going to get much better. This is the, <laughs> this is the one image that Rebecca, who uh, organized this, said she didn't understand <laughs> of all my cartoons. I don't know if anybody understands this. The notion here, this is a story we ran in Wired. And it's about moving from you know, reading the human genome to editing the human genome to writing the human genome. And so the idea here is growing new humans and watering them. This is the art we read of that story. But this is a really profound change that's coming, too. It might be 10 or 20 years. And it goes back to what I said before about the babies, and about CRISPR and being able to edit genes. And the notion here is that we can take our genomes, we can look at the weaknesses, we can edit the genes, and possibly we can't just reproduce ourselves to be stronger. We can make ourselves as we are stronger. And that could make a huge difference in retirement as we get older. That's not coming now, but I don't think we're that far away. Remember, first was reading the human genome, the Human Genome Project. Then it was editing the human genome. That's CRISPR. Now it's writing the human genome. All right, so that's stage six, retirement. Let's go to stage seven, eternal life. As you can imagine, this is the last section in my speech, and then we'll move to Q&A. Eternal life, what the hell are you talking about, Nick? So we read a really interesting story in Wired recently about a guy who was a good, a guy who was a good developer, and his father was dying. And so what he did is he sat with his father, and he recorded a couple hundred hours of his father talking about his life, his father's stories. And he inputted that into his machine, and he created a chatbot that sounded like his father, <laughs> that had all the information his father had, that knew the jokes his father liked to tell, that had the intonations of his father. And it's one of the more emotionally profound stories I think we've run. And what happens at the end of the story is he builds this chatbot, and then he plays it to his father, who's near the end of his life, who has terminal illness, and to his mother. And they both say they capture the essence of the person. And then, more importantly, he takes the chatbot and plays it for his child. And his child realizes that he can always talk to grandpa even after grandpa passes. And we could all have this done, right? This is one hacker right now with a creative recording project. But in a few years, <laughs> this will be possible for all of us. And we will, in some ways, be able to live in at least the memories of the people close to us or the people who want to engage with our chatbots, you know, in a, in a profound way. And that's not it. You know, we're also entering another technology, another technology of creating a brain-machine interface. So we know that the brain is made of neurons. It's made of electrical signals that go back and forth. You know, it's complicated, right? If the brain were simple enough to really understand, we wouldn't be smart enough to understand it. But we are beginning to understand how these electrical signals work. And we're beginning to be able to input electrical signals that can change memories or that can even control the motions or habits of rats, for example. And so there are a lot of people, including Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk. This is from a story we wrote about a guy named a Boston innovator, Brian Johnson, trying to figure out how to read the electrical signals that make up our brain. But then think about what happens when you can read and when you can write, when you can extract, when you can input. Now we're way off from this. And again, this is not going to happen tomorrow. This is not going to happen for a while. But when Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and other people with hundreds of millions of dollars are working on something, there is a chance. And so, First step, you'll be able to input things, right? So there's the dream of being able to like, learn a language just by having that input, or at least having your memories changed, and maybe you can delete bad memories. But think about what it really means. You can actually share information with other humans through the internet. And in some ways, you can download, perhaps, the contents of your brain and store it and save it for other people to see, for other people to learn from. If we had Einstein's brain right now, I wouldn't mind downloading some of it into my head. And so the impact of what it means to be a person 
if this comes about in some way or another in 25 years, if this comes about, it will profoundly change. We won't just be people with thoughts inside of our head and our own memories that are kind of eroding and changing every day. We'll all be linked together, and it will change the whole nature of the species. And so we will, in some ways, be able to live forever. OK, we might live forever. Speeches do not go on forever. So I'm going to wrap this up, and we're going to move to Q&A. Um, I'm happy to answer anything about babies. I'm happy to answer anything about death. I'm happy to answer anything about Wired. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening uh, so attentively, and I look forward to your questions. Hi, Justin Warren from, uh, from Pivot9. Um, question about, about the future that you're, you're painting out here. What do you think the interaction of uh, income inequality and the relationship between capital and labor and what we're seeing in the world, how do you think that's going to impact on what you've spoken? Oh, man, that is a great question. So I've always, I was really optimistic 20 years ago that technology would improve income, in, in, income inequality, make us more equal, right? Because everybody would have access to the same things. And in some ways, it has improved equality, right? We all have access to, we all have the same access to Wikipedia, right? We can more or less all access it from a thing in our pocket. We have access to all the information in the world. But what's so interesting is that the great tech revolution has come along at the same time as massive increases in income inequality. It doesn't say it's causal, they're just correlated. So my fear is that what happens with tech is that it does, it consolidates wealth in a relatively small number of companies and a relatively small number of employees at those small number of companies. And that as tech continues to swallow other industries, you will see income inequality get worse. So this is one of the reasons why I love an engaged, a government deeply engaged in this technological transformation and in this workforce transformation, to make sure that there are opportunities for retraining, to make sure that there are competitive marketplaces so we don't have dominant companies in certain industries so that all the power and the wealth consolidates with them. So my hope would be that you could make the world more equal. My fear is that the trend of the world becoming less equal will, will continue. There's a question here. Uh, Miran over there. Hello. Controlling uh, what's news and what's not news and what's fake and what's real. Yeah. Uh, with the access being so predominant, you can, and making up anything that is news, how do you know in future what's real and what's fake? And uh, you're basically listening to different points of view, and there's no uh, nature of the, uh, what is fact and what's fiction. Yeah, so that is, that is the central, that is one of the central challenges for these platforms where information is distributed. So how does Facebook identify whether a story is false or true? Well, you can take signals like the publication it's created by. If it's created by a publication that was, has been on Facebook for 20 years versus a publication that's been on Facebook for 20 minutes, more likely to be true from the latter one. You can look at the comments of humans, right? If humans say this is false, or in fact, they know that if the word Snopes appear in the comments section, the story is more likely to be false. You can look at where it was created. You can use analysis to see if the text is original. Um, there are all kinds of signals that you can take to see whether a story is true or false. You can look at images. You can see whether they've been manipulated. You can see whether they're real. You could sort of compare whether all of those elements in that Barack Obama image are from the same time period or taken by the same camera. So there are all kinds of technological tricks you can use to determine whether the veracity of an image or, or, or a story. The problem is, of course, this is an arms race, and it's adversarial. And so the people making the manipulative information will learn what you're doing, and they will counter it. So how do you, as a consumer, know what is real and what is false? You can't. You can do your best. You can see, is this from a trustworthy source? Has it been shared by people who are trustworthy? Does it seem like it's something that's true? Is there information that backs it up? If there isn't, maybe don't share it. Maybe don't reshare it. Maybe don't send it out further into the stream. But this is going to be one of the central civic problems, I think, of the next, next period of time. I think what we saw in 2016 was just the beginning. We have time for a last question over there. Uh... Nick, what's your thoughts and any use cases you have on technology's impact on religion and that part of humanity? Oh, man. <laughs> you know, we're, um, we're trying to figure out a way at Wired to write about the way Christian groups in the Midwest are thinking about technology. And I think that there's, you know, you can imagine that if technology had been developed by people with a 
different sense of Christian values and the redistribution of wealth, the way one works, the balance of family. You can imagine a whole, if, if tech had been invented by people from you know, deeply Christian backgrounds, you would have very different tech than you do right now. Not that it would be better or worse, it would just be different. Um, and so that's one thing I think about, right? How do, you, how do those value systems mix? The other thing is whether, you know, whether tech weakens the role of religion in life because it explains so many of the mysteries of the universe. And when you have explanations, like religion exists partly to explain the way the universe works to us. And as we, as science and tech explain the way the universe works, maybe you don't need religion as much. And that's, of course, one of the age-old debates inside of religion and how you reconcile the two. And my hope would be that religion, with all the cultural values it brings and the ways it changes the way we relate to each other and the ways it helps us think about the world, that religion will thrive alongside tech. But in some ways, they, in some ways they're additive, but in some ways they're competitive. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you for the very nice introduction, sir. Thank you. That was a pleasure.